Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships, How can relationships evolve, evolve with people evolve as they grow and change? Hi, welcome to the Curious Fox podcast. For those challenging the status quo in love, sex, and relationships. My name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Misla. And today we're speaking with Ari Kardash about relationship agreements. Ari is the author of the best-selling book, Relationship Agreements, A Simple and Effective Guide for Strengthening Communication, Reducing Conflict, and Increasing Intimacy to Design Your Ideal Relationship. It is a really practical guide for creating and working through relationship agreements. Eri is a former leadership development professional at Amazon.com, and she is now one of the most highly referred relationship coaches globally, working with clients across six continents, ranging from top tech execs to Hollywood celebrities to ordinary people living extraordinary lives. She's known for her passion for helping powerful people create even more powerful relationships, specifically helping people elevate their relationships within themselves and others for deeper, more intimate and fulfilling connections. Love her work. And relationship agreements themselves are one of the main tools for relationship design. It's one of the most commonly discussed topics when people are at the beginning of their journey into non monogamy. The relationship agreements often sound like rules at the beginning and often designed with safety in mind and often out of fear, essentially with prevention energy. How can I prevent my partner from falling in love with somebody else? How can I prevent my partner from leaving me? How can I prevent my partner from lying to me? Similarly, they often feel like a tool for control. If I know or demand when, what, with whom, at what time, for how long, etc., I will feel safe. Hopefully, in time, with a little bit of support and practice, people can really move into a place where they can arrive at relationship agreements with creation energy. How can we create a relationship where everyone will be heard? How can we create a dynamic that's supportive to all parties? How can we nurture a connection that can withstand some experimentation? That completely resonates. I think historically in my relationship agreements, they have absolutely centered around prevention and protecting. And mainly mm -hmm. they've been around things like opening up or house chores. And so I think that's why I was particularly excited to have the conversation with Ari, because I am interested in approaching agreements differently something that can withstand the evolution in my relationships. I think specifically thinking about how do I design new intentions and agreements with my partners that focus more on connection and autonomy and delight versus what you said, which is control and prevention and fear. And so, yeah, I was excited about bringing that energy into our conversation and she absolutely delivered. Yeah. And Ari shares some great ways for us to reframe how we approach relationship agreements from awkward, boring, or contentious, which what some folks think that when they hear the phrase, to intentional, playful, and juicy. The conversation made us laugh, think, and jot down some homework for ourselves. We hope you enjoyed the interview. <laughs> Ari, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you on. Hello. I'm so excited to be here with you both. Yeah. And you're joining from Bali. Calling all the way from Bali, Indonesia. It is a beautiful night here. Beautiful. I like our, <laughs> our international hang today. We're literally in the four corners of the planet, all coming together. Hey! <laughs> So as long as we've been doing Curious Fox and as many podcast episodes and events as we've been doing, somewhere in this form of some conversation, relationship agreements comes up. 
because in the beginning, I think people use it as a blanket, as a way of protecting themselves, Mm -hmm. particularly if they're opening up in a relationship. And then over time, hopefully folks get the practice of evolving those things and using those as moments to clarify what's going on in their relationships. But I feel like at every stage, there's some agreement, whether it be about the dishes or where like, you know, your clothes go in the middle of the living room (laughs) or bigger things like, you know, who can sleep with whom and who's allowed and where and those types of things. And so there's a lot that we want to unpack with you. And yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that sparked this for Effie and I was a conversation about your book. And so Effie, Effie referenced it. I think you you found it first, right, Effie? Yes. No, we actually have a mutual friend, Mel, um, or Lady M, ah! as she likes to go by. Yeah. Lady M. Lady M. She's amazing. She is beautiful <laughs> and wonderful and magical. And um, so she heard me speak about relationship by design, which is the the, co- the coaching philosophy that I go by. And the idea is to consciously and dynamically design our relationships in a way that we can thrive. And people ask yes. me, that, you know, people like, oh, that's amazing. And how do you do that? And and a part of the process is to make some agreements, to 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 get clear on a vision a shared vision, whatever that is, and, and make some agreements to to get to that vision in, in a practical kind of way. So like our heart is our heart. And then there is like the practicality of 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, you know, domestic uh, partnerships or co-parenting, or even if we're just lovers, it's like, you know, the idea is to, to have a shared vision and to name it and then have agreements so that we can get that. And upon hearing me talk about this um, at some panel, she came to me with your book. She actually gave me your book, and she's like, ah. "You should. This is this is this is what you're talking about. You should you should read this book." And I've had it for a long time. I have notes all over it. It's like I have like five core books that I, I have on my uh, bookshelf that are annotated all over, and your book is one of them. I, I, wow! Thank you. What an honor. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> what I find about the book that it's a very practical look at the execution of relationship by design. It, it's very yeah. like hold someone's hand and like good questions, good homework, you know, section by section. It's a real sort of practical execution of how you design your relationship. And this idea of relationship agreements just come up over and over again. And I love that you wrote the book on it. <laughs> I, yeah, literally wrote the book on it. Thank you. <laughs> literally. Yeah. At the time, there was, like, at the time when I was writing it or going through it, living the experience, there just wasn't anything out there. Mm-hmm. I guess 10 years ago now. Wow, I'm all of a sudden feeling old. But <laughs> I remember at the time, like there was one workshop anywhere in the world I could find on it. And it was in this little basement in, in Seattle. And it was one couple who had been doing ethical non-monogamy for you know, most of their lives. And they're like, yeah. And we created this relationship agreement. And it was pretty much a legal contract and super legalistic. Mm, yeah. And I thought it was super cool. I'm like, yeah, this is great. My dad's a lawyer. So like, this is perfect. So we pretty much just like <laughs> contract and made it ours. And then over time, I was like, this doesn't feel like us. So how do we, mm. that relationship by design, how do we create something that feels authentically us that can grow and change as we grow and change? Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I'm wondering if we can start from a place of even just defining what agreements mean, because I think in the, in our work and with our clients and what we hear in our events is that people conflate agreements with rules, with boundaries, mm-hmm. with promises, with commitments. And so maybe some of those are synonyms for others, but I'm wondering if you can kind of help us understand when you talk about relationship agreements, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, so the big, the big two that I hear is, is it a rule? I think a lot of us grew up with in some amount of punitive culture, right? So either it was your religious background or you were in school or your parents, whatever it was, there were a lot of rules that were put on us as children. And that kind of caused a lot of, I'm going to say trauma, a lot of pent up, built up emotional stress in our bodies. And so when you hear relationship agreements, many people instantly are like, oh my God, no. It's a rule and don't effing tell me what to do with my life, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And that can be really dangerous and unhealthy. And so for me, I really want to clarify that these are agreements that two consenting, two or more consenting adults are coming together to create, but it's a living document that I really Mm -hmm. wanted to have the freedom to grow and change with you as you grow and change. And you can be agile with it, but there's power in actually speaking it because we all are making assumptions and expectations of each other all the time, all the time. Sometimes we talk about it. Sometimes we don't. We all have our own unique lenses in the world. And so it's like, how do you integrate this and just be transparent? 
and honest with your communication about, you know what, this is what would feel really good to me. I'd like to make this request that this be one of our agreements for the time being. And we can always revisit it. And if it's not working, we'll modify. We'll be curious and modify. And if it is working, mm. you're going to support us in our growth and our love. Awesome. Let's mm-hmm. keep doing what works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What I hear from you that I didn't know in the beginning. So I'm now many years, I've been with my wife almost 10 years. We have an open marriage. And so for at least 10 years, we have been practicing it. However, in the beginning, that is not what it felt like. It didn't feel like it could evolve and it very much felt like rules. And let me say transparently, I was the one who was imposing the things. I introduced non-monogamy into a relationship. And yet when it started conceptually, it was great. We were like Uh thrilled conceptually. And then she actually got into another relationship first. And I was like, oh, I don't like this at all. This feels terrible. And so then it was like, let's agree that you don't do this, that you don't do that, that you come home at this time, that you avoid these restaurants, that you text me every hour. Like, let's make those agreements. Yeah. It's going to be much better if we do, I'm sure. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Let's just agree to those things. And some things she did and some things she didn't. But realize, I mean, now I realize looking back, those are really rules about me, what I needed to feel safe. And, and now I can have the conversation in a different way. Hey, I am feeling unsafe and let's talk about what that looks like or what that means, et cetera. But I wonder if that's been your experience that in the beginning for folks, oh God, it is yeah. very much like rules and then it evolves. Yeah. Tell me about that. Totally. And, and I, and when I, when people start making this, I often see like their first relationship agreement is like 42 pages long. <laughs> like, you know, you cannot go to the Chinese restaurant 40 seconds, right? It's like, uh, but I, I get it. And that, it's that, it's that, oh my God, this is so uncomfortable and there's no blueprint. And there are more and more examples. Like 10 years ago, it was harder to find this, but now there's TV mm-hmm. shows and there's podcasts and there's books and there's resources. And like, it's almost strange if you've never met somebody who is in some form of open relationship at some point in their life. Mm-hmm. And that's really cool. And so now you have more ideas of like, how, how are other people doing it? I can learn from other people's life lessons and what's worked and what mm-hmm. hasn't, which is really cool. But at the time there wasn't. And so a lot of people are like, oh my God, how do I show up in this thing that is so taboo or so not mainstream? And now we can breathe into it and try new things a little bit more lessons learned from other people. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So what I find interesting is the relationship agreements are something that I think the non-monogamous community or people who are practicing open relationships have kind of brought up to the surface. And it's now a done thing, like having agreements. What I find, you know, in my work, I work with anybody who wants to design their relationships. And some people will come to me and they'll say, we want to open up our relationship. I go, great. Let's just go through the process. And they'll come out the other side and they will remain monogamous, but the relationship will look entirely different than the one they came in with. Right. Yeah. And a lot of that is because they make some agreements on what the relationship is going to look like and what they want it, mm-hmm. what they want it to feel like and um, how it shows up in the world, like how it shows up domestically, how it shows up socially, how it, sh- how it shows up financially, like in these areas. And I think it's something yes. that it makes a lot of difference to monogamous relationships as well. I think monogamy historically have, you know, what I, what I say is come up with default settings, like default agreements. There's this like template agreement in monogamy that you sign up to that you think okay well I, I, we have the agreement like it's just like a template thing that we sign you know proverbially sign and i think it doesn't work for everyone and they think that sometimes they, yeah. they think they come to the conclusion that it's monogamy that's not working for them rather than yeah. the agreements that they signed up to that isn't working for them yeah exactly exactly yeah. and i didn't i didn't finish my thought from before but this ties in really nicely in the beginning people are like looking for how do we look at how do we make our agreements and eat it doesn't matter your relationship structure oftentimes they are really big even if you're Mm -hmm. monogamous they can be like how do we enforce these rules and oftentimes i see the monogamous the more monogamous rules being like you can't hang out with these people Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and definitely don't talk to your ex definitely right right. that's the most important one right it's like okay so that all that shows up in this long this long list but then we boil it down over time when we have that with time, there becomes more trust, I think. And we get clear on our values and clear on what works and what doesn't work. So I think it is this, this beautiful navigation of what is actually showing up for us when we talk about this instead of just making assumptions. And so many people are unconsciously modeling what their caregivers did for them right? And I'm guessing that most people didn't have the most beautiful, perfect caregiving models for what a healthy relationship is and can be. 
And we just are learning more and more about like what's passed down in our genes now. There's so many cool studies out there of like your grandmother's trauma is passed down to your mother, is passed down to you. It's three generations big. So Mm -hmm. stuff you don't even know about is impacting you and showing up in how you relate with others. So there's a lot you don't know. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about, Mm -hmm. oh, this is how I perceive a healthy relationship to be. Oh, this is what I think my role in this relationship looks like. And this is who I think does the dishes. And this is who I think pays the bills. And right, it's like, well, what if you had more freedom than that? Mm-hmm. What if you could just breathe into the fact that you you are so much more creative and so much more powerful and you don't have to follow the rules if they don't work for you. And we don't even know if they don't work for you if you don't question them. So let's just question them in this safe space and let's make it a safe space and have the tools to have this really vulnerable dialogue of, you know what, all my life I've been the caregiver and I'm tired and I'm tired of that right now. And here's, Mm. I have a request of, Hey, it would, I would feel really seen and cared and loved if you would be in charge of this role in this dynamic. Mm. Can we try it out for a month and just, and then check in? It's a whole different way of being. Yeah, Mm, absolutely. I got to write that down. Yeah. (laughs) that's the conversation mm-hmm. i need yeah. to have right now yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> that's funny so Ari, i have a question i i mean i think it's undoubted that relationship agreements even the one or two really breathe air and air, air and life into a relationship i've seen this your book talks about this i know that you've seen it i'm curious to how you would you imagine could pe- people could approach their existing partners and and start this idea of relationship agreements or relationship design? Yeah. First of all, I say, know that this idea can be triggering. And usually it's more triggering for one partner than the other. Mm. I, I oftentimes love, you know, when I was back when I was teaching workshops on this, I would have, you know, a couple show up and one person was there and like taking all the notes and super engaged. And the other person looked like they, they were just done. Like they were obviously dragged there and they did not agree with this. And they were shut down with the idea. And so, and it just takes some warming up of like, what if this wasn't a legal contract? What if this is something that you guys get to design and create together? Just like visioning, like, what do you want Mm -hmm. for your future? Let's get excited and just dream. And how do we do that in a setting that feels juicy? So it's not like we're back in school. How do you be really intentional and conscious about where you're doing this? together? Okay, let's, let's go on a picnic at the beach and let's talk about like, what would, what would feel really good for us with maybe some easier, low hanging fruit and just see how it feels of like, mm-hmm. how do we want to have more fun in our relationship? Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Was, what is there? Like who wants to be in charge of like introducing new fun, sexy things to try? Maybe we can take turns once a week. Oh, cool. That's a fun agreement. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and then you start working up towards more of the more uh, heavier topics with time and with practice. And sometimes you need to do that with the help of another professional, with a coach or therapist, especially around triggering topics around like sex and finances. That can be really hard. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It's okay to get help. It's okay to have somebody else witness and guide and help mediate when things start to get heated. This is a skill set that we didn't learn. None of, as far as I know, None of us here took classes growing up on how to be no. in relationship, no. right? Absolutely. And, and so it's like, okay, well, this is new territory and we get to learn and grow and be students. And if we go in with that student mindset of we're not going to be perfect at it, what we create is a rough draft. We're trying it out and we can be playful and have fun. And if it doesn't feel good, we can try on something new. If you go in with that kind of mindset, you invite your partner in or your partner's in with that kind of mindset. Let's be playful. Let's have fun with this and just see what happens. Then the deeper stuff comes more naturally and it comes with a little less weight and you already figure out how you want to talk about things. And as pieces fall in place, it gets easier and easier. And once the foundation is there, once you've got something in place and it's written down, you'll breathe and you actually celebrate what you created because this is a creation, a co-creation. Then it's like, oh, the revisions are not that hard. And asking for a change or asking for something new is just, it comes more easily. Yeah. Yeah. 
I love the idea of, again, I think I keep going back to the, the fact that number one, approaching it with curiosity, approaching it with a sense of lightness and approaching it, knowing that it can be revised. You can come back and revisit it. I even like kind of the trial period of like, let's try this out for a month. Let's see how yeah. that feels. Because I think the folks that do feel more resistant to something that feels like confines or rules can at least take some solace. And there's an opportunity for us to revisit this at some point. I don't have to live in this space in this way all this time it also feels hopeful right it's really Mm. it has a when I hear you talk about it it really makes me think oh this is a very hopeful way of looking at a relationship Mm. that it is not like we're gonna put some rules in place and if people like obey the rules it's good if it's not you know and the second you screw up we're done (laughs) exactly 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 whereas I think to think about them as agreements as things that you approach with sort of with playfully and talk through stuff and and for it to be a like visioning and designing I think it really it really feels hopeful yeah and I imagine that that you can experience and the tone of that conversation will tell you a little bit about where you are in your relationship. So if it is feeling light and hopeful and fun, that is something versus if it really feels like a negotiation, if people are feeling resentful, if it does feel like, like then, you know, Oh, there's something else going on in this space. Maybe then that's the time to reach out to the therapist or the coach and say, actually, we're going to need some help navigating through this because it feels really tense that's when you want to learn the things like the communication tools and, and the self-awareness and the self-reflection tools of saying, wow, like we, I, this word, I, I try to, I try to use carefully, but trauma, we all carry trauma and different levels and different experiences in a life and all, we all do. So how do you be sensitive to that? Because relationships, especially the juicy ones are going to be beautiful opportunities where you've attracted at least one mate and the mate is going to be a reflection, like a mirror for you. And at the same time, they're going to push on those, on those wounds. Mm -hmm. They're going to trigger you. And in that trigger is an opportunity to heal and an opportunity to shift the dynamic and really level up in how we are as humans in relationship and love and deepen to a level that most people never get to experience, but it has to be done. So with care and thoughtfulness and science (laughs) like, and there are great tools out there. So let's use them and then move into like, okay, now that we've got the tools, now we can create the relationship agreements. Now that we can like really be, be present and compassionate with our truth. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it, it certainly takes a level of vulnerability and trust. Yeah. And so walking into that space with that intention. And then, so talk, can we talk a little bit about when that doesn't happen, when it does feel either contentious or when there is a misstep? Are there some, well, maybe even back up, are there some common missteps that happen and how can folks recover from that? Like how do, if someone's listening to this and they had a relationship agreement conversation last week that did not sound like this, <laughs> how does one go back and say, oh, actually, can we do a redo? Yeah. So one of the things that I see oftentimes is that when they, when people sit down, that it is approached from the, I'm going to, I don't even want to say wrong. It's approached from that. We're going to make the legal contract. Mm-hmm. That's, that's mm-hmm. like the biggest, I'm like, no, no, no red flag. If you're approaching it to hold somebody in place, mm-hmm. to make sure that you can mm-hmm. enforce control, right. Mm-hmm. Then, then that's not healthy. And I'm going to say, mm-hmm. pause, if, an, if you're noticing in you that part of your goal to create this is to control them or to control yourself, right? If you mm-hmm. don't feel like you have the self-control, so you're putting this on paper to like help you shift. Okay. Well, like let's work on what's really under there. This is a symptom mm-hmm. and let's deal with what's actually the problem with the core first. So that's one of the big ones. Another one might be that you are being a little too aggressive. Like maybe it is way too detailed. And you're not, and you're missing the point that this is about love and this is about how do you foster a deeper connection? So when it's getting into like, oh yeah. And all, and every Tuesday at 8 33 AM, you're going to do right. It's like, no, that's not allowing us to be authentic in the moment. And how can we have freedom and safety? So I, I really focus on this triangle of love, freedom, and safety. And if we have, and we, we have, and we can have all three and this this tool, this relationship agreement 
should help foster all three of those. It should build more love. It should help you feel more safe and it should give you more freedom because you're like, I know the sandbox I'm playing in. Mm. I know where I can go to and it feels so mm-hmm. good because I agreed to this. Yay. Let's go like yeah. have a sand pit party, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the couple of things come up for me. One is it's uh, similarly to agreements. I mean, similar to boundaries. Often boundaries perceive, are perceived as like lines in the sand, right? It's like a, a no, like it's a line in the sand. Um, the way that I'd like to think of boundaries is like the line that encapsulates all the things that we want and then leaves the things that we don't want out. So it's like you and me and all these things are included in this, in the sand pit, as you call it. And the things that we don't want to, like the things that we're not going to do are on the outside. So it's not necessarily a, a line in the sand between to people, but more like, what is it? What is a boundary that we can set that, that contains us and all the things that we want to do? Um, and these other things that we don't want to do. And I think I'm similarly, this is kind of what I'm hearing. The agreements are about what we want to create. Like the the language that I use often is like, what is it that we want to create? What are the ways, what are the agreements that we can have in place so we can create this vision, this shared vision that, and the shared life, the shared relationship and the connection that we want to, we want to have. And I think it's, it's, it's an inclusive thing, even though for some, it might feel like an exclusive, this like very rigid exclusion thing. I love giving other tools. If you've never heard of Byron Katie, she's phenomenal. Her work is amazing. Mm -hmm. And one of her, one of the most amazing tools she calls the work or inquiry. And if you notice you have this story, this is a great place to use this tool. If you notice you have a story Mm -hmm. of like, this is a boundary. It's keeping me in place. They don't want me to do X. They don't want me to have fun. They don't want me to have pleasure, whatever it might be like. That's a story. It's a story Mm -hmm. in your head and it's causing you suffering. So let's just mm-hmm. look at it. Is that true? You might be like, yes, it's true. Is it really true? Like, is it absolutely true? And you're like, ah, no, there's lots of other examples where my partner has actually been encouraging me to have pleasure or mm-hmm. play or not control me or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, who do, you, who do you show up as when you believe that thought? If you believe it's a boundary that you're, it's just trying to pin you down, you're going to show up aggressive, defensive. You're going to show up ready to fight or, or run or put it to them, you know? But if you, if you didn't believe that thought, if you just change the story in your head and you're like, my partner loves me and we're creating these because we want to have this shared vision. We want to be mm-hmm. co-creative, right? And this mm-hmm. is for us. It's not for anybody else. It's just for us. Then how do you show up? It's like, oh, I show up with more compassion and softness and I'm excited. And I show up with a more um, juiciness in how I can talk about this. So it's like, well, question that, question that story that's causing you suffering before you go too far down that road. Cause it's not helping switch the story up, try something new. Yeah, absolutely. I'm wondering if there are ways, and even just thinking about for myself and my relationships, the ways in which to approach the conversation with the intention of also offering in addition to asking. And so I think what comes up for me is I think in the conversations that I've been in that are even with the best intentions, there is a level of, I'm going to ask you for this. And there's like the nervousness around that, or you're going to ask me for something. And now I'm going to feel a little defensive and we're going to like have to negotiate that line, but it feels very in, in the space of about me even though it's about the relationship, it is like, how am I going to, am I going to feel good in the relationship? How am I going to feel safe in the relationship? How am I going to feel taken care of? And I wonder even for myself, I'm thinking, can I approach those conversations and say, here's some things about you that I would love to offer. Knowing you, I would actually love to do the dishes every night. Cause you do so much. Like, is that something like, I'm wondering if that's an experience that you've had where there are some different ways to hack and, and work through some of what are the blocks of us having those conversations, which is I'm going to have to defend myself because they're going to take too much or yeah. naming all the things that makes it not fun. Where's the spontaneity? If we name everything in the relationship, are there some like tricks to kind of navigate past those stories in our minds? I love it. That's a great, I'm like that reframe. I've never heard anybody say that before. So <laughs> yay. Thank you. That was <laughs> awesome. And I would say, yeah, of course there's hacks. One of my favorite tools, just as I'm getting started with working with people in relationship is to have them get a piece of paper out and draw a picture of their face in the middle. And then all around the space around their, their face is just to write w- when I feel loved and cared for when dot, 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 and answer the question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I feel loved and cared for when you make me coffee in the morning, when, mm-hmm. when you give me a bath rub, 
when I get to escape to the ocean and read a book, like whatever mm-hmm. it might be, I'm just like, how do you feel loved and seen and cared for? And then you give this beautiful gift to your partner. And it's like, they have a cheat sheet where anytime they're mm-hmm. like, how can I show my partner that I love them? It, it, it's like literally right there. <laughs> yeah. And he, he's one and, and, and mm-hmm. show up. And I think that kind of thing could show up really beautifully when making a, an offering or suggestion of like, Hey, I know it means a lot to you when, when this thing happens, I, I would love to show up in, uh, I'd like to make an agreement with you. I'd like to offer you this gift in, in how I show up as your partner. Does that feel good? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I absolutely love that. And I think that the other thing that as Jackie was, was talking through that, that came up for me was actually setting an intention for the, the agreements. Like we're sitting down to, to have these agreements with the intention of, and, and start, mm-hmm. start with that, you know, with the intention of, you know, requesting an, or offering or, you know, creating this or with the intention to mm-hmm. really see each other or be seen or, or hear. I feel like that could also be a nice uh, prelude to sitting down to the agreements, to like set an intention yeah. for the experience. I love it. I love it. And when I, so I think over time, my, my work has really evolved, just like my life has really evolved. And at the time I was really focused on being super cognitive and like, how do I develop the, the mental mindset for doing this sort of thing? And now I take a much more holistic approach and I really want to bring in the head, heart, the body. How do we mm-hmm. uh, be in our somatic experience um, with ourselves? Mm-hmm. And I think setting the intention it, and this is like setting the container. We'll, we'll go a little mm-hmm. bit like hippie mm-hmm. talk. We're going to create that space though, for, for us to really show up with the same understanding. You know, we, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about pitfalls or red flags. And I think one of the red flags is coming to this, this situation or this experience together with totally different perceptions of what's going on, totally mm-hmm. different definitions of like, what is a relationship agreement, totally different, defer- totally different definitions of, okay, we're married. What does married mean? Mm-hmm. And so getting really clear on like, what are these keywords mean and questioning them? And mm-hmm. then also when we're showing up with this intention setting, we get to be clear. Oh, my intention is to be open and curious with you during this time mm-hmm. or in this document or in this thing that we're creating to be really clear in my self-awareness and to call when mm-hmm. something isn't a, isn't a yes, a totally yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and also to own my nose and to create a culture of safety in my answer is my answer. And I don't have to go along with it just because you want it. We're going to really like lean into the discomfort of, we may not always agree and that's okay. We're going to talk through the meaning and the feelings behind it. And I highly recommend that. Well, first of all, you will most likely get triggered at some point in time when creating a relationship agreement and don't feel like you have to like sludge through it. Like when that happens, pause. Uh, a tool I love to use is called alarm bells. When you start to feel that, like walk on eggshells, you mm-hmm. want to fight, light, freeze, or fawn. Mm-hmm. You want to like, you don't know, fawn, you're a people pleasing, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're caretaking mm-hmm. instantly. So when that happens, notice it and call alarm bells and say, Oh, whoa. Okay. When, when alarm bells is called, everybody involved in this scene, if we're all going to close mm-hmm. our eyes and take three deep breaths. Mm-hmm. And then check in on what do we need to feel safe? Yeah. Pause, yeah. just pause. And like, maybe it means I need to go for a two minute walk. Maybe it means mm-hmm. I just need to like, can you just hold my hand for a minute? This is really intense for me, right? And breathing into that space and asking for what you need. And then when you're ready, coming back into mm-hmm. the dialogue about what was coming up for you, because it's not really about who does the dishes. Mm-hmm. It might be the <laughs> it's happen. never about the dishes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's something that we talk about all the time it's never it's about true. The we're gonna have a shirt when we have merch that's gonna be on one of our shirts it's never about the dishes <laughs> it's never, never about, about the dishes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah um, two things actually come up for me one is effie as you're sharing you know about setting an intention i do think that makes a lot of sense i think that in the beginning of my marriage for example the intention around setting some agreements was about safety and i think now almost 10 years into it it's not that's not the same intention and i think that when we have done relationship check-ins and we're like, how are we? We've used that as the litmus test and we're both like, we're good. You're good. We're good. Great. Like mm-hmm. move on. But really what the, what an intention should be now is how do we have more fun and lightness together? Mm-hmm. Because lots of conversations about mortgages and, you know, dinners and who's doing the grocery, right? Like, so the safety part, we're good. <laughs> we're yeah. like settled into that. But now agreements around how do we enjoy each other? How do we have lightness? Mm-hmm. How do we have play? How do we have fun? 
And as someone who is Hispanic, who is queer, I think that there is also something about even if you are not in a cis heteronormative monogamous relationship, we bring in those things, those ideas, those stories into Mm -hmm. our relationships. And so I think that sometimes it can be just as it is challenging if you are in a cis heteronormative monogamous relationship to push back on the roles that have been prescribed to you when you have the freedom to actually not follow any of those, because now you're in a same sex relationship, you're not like all of the other ways in which you can step outside of that box. It does not mean that now, you know what to do (laughs) now that, you know, you're just, when I was in there, I was like, Oh, I'm the one who should be cooking and doing the dishes, even though I'm with a woman. So I don't know why that was the case, but that was the thing that was in my mind. And then that had to be really challenged. And so I feel like this is an opportunity then for us to each say, to your point, why, why are we doing this? Why is it like that? Mm -hmm. How can we design it our own way? I love it. And the, the piece that I also, we definitely starting to talk more about more about this on this podcast and, and definitely where I'm shifting in, in, in my life and, and reflecting in my coaching as well, this idea of a, a holistic, holistic approach, mind, body, and spirit, this idea of, you know, when, when I hear you say like, when the alarm bells come up, For most people, I'm finding that those alarm bells aren't heard. We are so disconnected from Mm -hmm. our body. We are so um, locked into our mind, locked into our way of being. So um, what we call the noise on the show, the external stuff feels so loud that we we can't hear our our internal um, intuition, our internal dialogue. I think in order to be, I think in order to sit down to do... um, relationship agreements that really honor us i think we also need to work on that body mind connection and really understand the inner voice that's that will guide us if we can just tune into it i think if you don't work on that and you just sit down to do relationship agreements you'll you'll get some agreements down for sure but i would i would question the um the authenticity of it the, the, the that it really comes from your inner voice i think and i love that that's kind of where you're going and same here i find things like somatic experiencing and movement meditation and things that really connect you to your body has an immense impact on on relationships Yes. You know, one of my favorite tools is if you're like, I don't even know how to begin, especially if you're in a relationship and you're like talking about this, one of my favorite things is a pillow fight. Uh, it's a wonderful <laughs> tool. I make an agreement that we can't go for the head, right? <laughs> especially if somebody's strong than another person. I have like a pillow fight, like a uh, position that I love, or like my ass is pretty much up in the air, but I feel like getting their ass at the same time. And it's wonderful. And it, it's like, I can, I can take out my anger and my shame and my fear. And like, mm. if you want to scream, scream, if you want to cry, cry, just, you can go to town on most people's butts and they're like, cool. It's okay. <laughs> and they're going to town on you and you're like, this is actually kind of hilarious. And by the end, we're usually rolling around laughing. Right. And it's mm-hmm. like, Oh my gosh, that felt so good to just get that out. So if you, mm-hmm. or if you're new to how the heck do I bring in this thing of somatics and like, it sounds so big, mm-hmm. right. It's like, have a pillow fight, have some fun with this. You're moving the things through your body. And you're just releasing mm-hmm. it. Put on some terrible, wonderful eighties music and have a dance party together. Right. <laughs> dance just like, party. Get it out, get it out mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. come back and then come back and see what's there. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. A dance party before relationship agreements. Yes. yes. <laughs> and now we're to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dance party to begin, dance party mm-hmm. to end. So, yep. yeah. yeah. <laughs> or some beautiful, juicy, sexy times. Yeah. Yes. I, I even like that. I like that combo. Yeah, I like that combo. Yeah. Um, dance party, relationship agreements, some juicy hotness at the end. Uh-huh. Hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So many times I think that I have gotten into conversations that were harder than they needed to be because I had not moved the energy because that energy was like pent mm. up inside of me. And I like came out through my words as opposed to softness coming out because I danced it out earlier. So yes, yeah. to dance yeah. party. Yeah. There's this really powerful spectrum I remember learning about at some point in, in my studies. And it was this truth versus compassion. And I want one end of the spectrum is truth and one end of the, of the spectrum is compassion. And we tend to choose to fall on one side or the other. And oftentimes when we're triggered or in our trauma expression, we're going to be speaking from one side or the other. So that usually the person who's in their truth is like delivering the hard truth and they're just like mm-hmm. spitting it at you, right? Mm-hmm. And the person who's in their compassion is like, 
I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to say anything. I just can't wait to get out of that door Mm -hmm. or let me take care of you. Let me just take care of you. It's all fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and neither one is balanced. And so how do we Mm -hmm. move towards the middle? Because truth without compassion is abuse and compassion without Mm -hmm. truth is Mm enabling. So how do we move more towards the middle together to speak our truth with compassion? Mm -hmm. That's where the juice can come from. And that's where these beautiful relationship agreements really blossom. Yeah. Yeah. I think also the key factor in all that is I have to add is courage. Because what I find where where it fails in in my personal life and definitely with my clients where I see the blockages is the courage. Courage to do that. Courage to be in the middle. Because when we are in our truth or our compassion or where we you know, do it out of fight, flight, freeze or fawn. It is because we're doing it out of fear and, and to approach it. It's only when you approach it through courage that you can do that middle part, or you can do that kind of um, negotiation or, or um, a true compromise that doesn't feel like you're abandoning yourself, that you can come to it for the creative mindset. And I think that's, that's also something to cultivate and to set an intention for, you know, like curiosity, openness, and courage. I think that's, it's, it's just, it, recently it's been coming up in my work over and over again. And I know Brené Brown does amazing work on, on this stuff. It's the, the missing, like the, the magical ingredient that just like unblocks all of these things is courage. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like, I, I think the words that are, that are sitting with me is intentionality, vulnerability, courage, Mm-hmm. play like it feels like if those words if you can if if folks are can write down those words and like yeah. put that on the top of the page where your relationship agreements are going to be <laughs> written that that can be like a nice guide yeah and i think for folks who want to dig deeper this is really like this is like a a movie trailer like this is just the preview like if you really want to dig into it then you need to go and get the book relationship agreements mm-hmm. a simple and effective guide for strengthening communication reducing conflict and increasing intimacy to design your ideal relationship we have it on our reading list so if folks go to mm-hmm. wearecuriousfoxes.com slash reading list we have it there I second Effie, what Effie shared in the beginning. It is an incredibly practical guide with some real examples, some real uh, mm-hmm. opportunities for you to do some self-reflection, for you to do some work with your partner or partners. Mm-hmm. And so I thank you for writing that because I should have read it 10 years ago when I first <laughs> read it, when I was first doing my relationship agreements. I've had to learn some things the hard way. It would have been better mm-hmm. to have the book. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate it. I do, before you go though, we want to ask you some uh, four questions that we ask okay. all of our guests. And so the first question that we would like to know about you is what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self about love, sex, or relationships? I am more than enough. Mm-hmm. That's it. I'm more than enough. And every time a new story, a new monster pops up, just going back, remember I'm more than enough and just trust that. Oh, love that's that. Beautiful. Love that's beautiful. that. Yep. That's like a, a t- that's tattoo worthy. If I was a tattoo kind of girl, <laughs> that's a tattoo worthy advice. So, okay. So what is one romantic or sexual adventure on your bucket list? Uh, actually it's pleasure first. It's really mm. starting to shift talking about like, you know, I think at some point it was mentioned, what is our intention for this next phase of our relationship? And, mm-hmm. and it might've been safe in the beginning. And right now it's for me in my life and in my relationship with my husband, it's how are we really putting pleasure first? And it doesn't just mean we're walking around with our hands down our pants, but it, it, it does mean like, how do I find the pleasure in how I'm slicing this cherry tomato right now yes. and watching the juice pour down and how am I finding mm-hmm. pleasure? in my time with my children and how am I finding pleasure in just being in the pause and the stillness mm-hmm. and it's really juicy <laughs> it's really juicy yeah. it ties into everything so I need to bring into the bedroom how can I be in my pleasure and really in my pleasure and not just in my head or trying to mm-hmm. please or trying to receive and take but like how do I just mm-hmm. be in the pleasure and that's yes. so juicy Love that. that. Yes. Yeah. I, this year has been my intention to focus on delight and wonder. And so I think that like fits into that. It's exactly Uh, that. It's like, how do I just feel, try to feel delighted and create that kind of magic? Like you said. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question is how do you challenge the status quo? (laughs) 
all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, Basically. Our whole life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, well, mm. like, I mean, so many ways. I mean, our story, my husband and I's story is in um, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Miracle of Love, because our relationship was challenged in a status quo of like, I am the opposite of what he's supposed to marry, right? He's, mm. he's a traditional Hindu Indian man from, a, from the state of Gujarat who's supposed to marry a woman who's from the same three villages and, you know, all the things. And I'm just not. I'm um, so far from that. And we met I'm so far from that. And here we are living this epic life in Bali and raising our children here in very unconventional ways and exploring what love and relationships is like in real time and trying it out and sharing our, our what we learn, what we don't learn, what goes well and what doesn't go well for us along mm-hmm. the way. And right now, the thing that's really challenging the status quo is yeah, I have been all sorts of labels from single, monogamous, polyamorous, I've tried swinging, I've tried all the things, right? I've been momogamish, where I'm focused on mostly just being a mom and I've loved it. Mm-hmm. And right now I'm challenging the status quo by, I have announced, I just, I'm trying celibacy on for the first time. <laughs> like wow. chosen. And that's so edgy. Like you're, wait a minute, you're in an open marriage and you're celibate. How does that work? Right? <laughs> like, uh-huh. Yeah. And it's juicy and fun and I'm learning so much about myself and it's like bringing this energy out in new ways that are totally not what you're supposed to, in quotes, do. Yeah. I love that. I, love I definitely that. love that. Yeah. I want to, I want to hear updates on like how it feels, what it feels like in your body, yeah. what, what it feels in your desire and nice. I love it. Yeah. Okay. And it is having a really cool impact on our marriage. So I just got to say like, well worth the experiment so far. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Can I be, can I be curious for a second? Is he, is he celibate as well? Uh, we decided that we wanted to go back and live the opposite lives of what we had, uh, our opposite, like late teen, early 20 years. And I was at my total slut phase mm-hmm. and I had a great time and I didn't pause for just being with myself and he was the mm-hmm. opposite. So we're taking ownership and authenticity over that thing that we missed out on, quote unquote, missed mm-hmm. out on. And yeah. so no, he's, he's not. He's being the opposite of that. I love that. Right. And so it's really beautiful to watch, like, how is that coming up for us? And what are we learning from it and reclaiming this thing? I love it. Wow. I love it. We have to do another episode just for the updates. Just for that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> tell us about on that. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So last but not least, what are you curious about lately? Oh, I'm always curious. Always. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's a lot, a lot of my time and passion is going towards emotional mastery and really understanding mm-hmm. how our emotions mm-hmm. impact our lives and mm-hmm. really plugging into integrity and what does it mean to really feel safe in who you are and all those millions of pieces you've created of yourself to protect yourself. What is it like to like be whole and feel whole mm-hmm. and know who you are and where you want to go and own your yeses and your noes. And it's really cool. And also tap into your intuition through that. Like, when mm. I feel a hole, my intuition is fucking solid. Excuse me. I don't yeah. know if I can say that. No, yes, you can't. Really yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, right? And it's, it's, it's so fun to be learning about. It's so powerful to be learning about. And I'm like, yes, more, 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 more. Yes. Nice. To Love that. It. Yeah, we yes. need to do a show and just have you update on that. Like that feels powerful. That feels mm-hmm. like a lifelong journey of of undoing and redoing and and restarting. And yeah, it's a lot and it's awesome. And and through <laughs> that, I mean, I'll, I'll just another like, oh, I'll just leave this cliffhanger. This weekend, mm-hmm. my husband and I are going away on a special trip of letting our old relationship die. And we're doing a special ceremony where it's just going to be like, here's all the things that we created that are self-sabotaging that didn't serve us. And we're not killing off our, our partnership, but we're killing off the old version of that relationship. It's been six years. It's time for something brand new. And how do we consciously say, I'm a different person than who we started dating? Like, how do we, how do we let go of all that and fall in love with the person in front of us? Wow. Love that. You are, you are doing a ritual to clear what, what we call clear cash. Like you're clearing <laughs> cash of your relationship. I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. It sounds so exciting. So like rich and I don't know, life affirming. I love that. Yeah. I kind of want to be like a fly on the wall. 
I know. <laughs> it's true. Yes. This feels like this feels like the first of many conversations that we're going to have. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah, we should. We should totally have you and your husband on. Would love. We um, when we were in person, we used to do socials, which now we are calling uh, foxtails, which were oh. opportunities for folks to really hear other folks stories and to hear mm. not only from educators and experts, but to hear from couples and hear from triads and hear from folks, mm. you know, solo poly fo- folks who are, are trying things out in their lives and learning from that and so yeah. we've been talking about some ways to introduce that into the podcast so this might be I one of those opportunities it. we might knock on your mm-hmm. door we'd be honored to be your guests yeah uh, mm-hmm. we'd love that we'd love, love that, that. I'd love that. Well, thank you. Thank you for for being on. Thank you for sharing wisdom. Thank you for your book. You're welcome. Really enjoy the conversation. So juicy. Thank you for joining <laughs> us from Bali. <laughs> <laughs> What a fun conversation. I really yeah. like her. I mean, I'm interested in your takeaways. I kept, you know, as always taking furious notes. And so there's a, f- a few things that not only captured my attention, but gave me some homework that I need to mm-hmm. apply. So should I, should I need my list first? Yeah, go for it. I think the first thing that I took away from that conversation was, and you mentioned this too, about intentionality. I think that I had forgotten purpose. I mean, yeah. except for, I mean, I know we're supposed purpose. to have relationship yeah. check-ins, yeah. right? We're supposed to have relationship agreements, like those things I know, but walking in with the intentionality of let's do this in order to create some agreements around how there's more connection or joy or fun. Like, let's mm. do this in order to have more play. Let's do this. Like, I think I, I was one of those folks who really connected relationship agreements to safety Mm -hmm. to ensure and clarity. Mm -hmm. I would say those two things, safety and clarity, which then can feel like serious things Mm -hmm. and like really, you know, rigid and hard conversation. And I am going to work now on reframing it so that my intention is lighter. And, and because we have the safety, we have the security, we have all those things, Mm -hmm. What we need now is more connection and play. So yes. So I love that. That was one of my takeaways. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a note to be made there. I think where you're at personally, I think it makes so much sense because you have that down with your partner, with your wife, that it's a long-term relationship, you have the safety part down and, you know, and, and it makes sense for you to sort of look at like, how do you find the light? How do you find joy? How do you play? I think for those who don't have that, it's hard to go to that place of how do we have fun? I think uh, establishing some ground rules that help people feel safe and grounded into the relationship. Absolutely. Along with how to have fun, how to have delight, I think makes sense. I think finding that balance, I think you're where you are in your relationship, you're like down the line and you've done a lot of the work already. Mm -hmm. So you're like, we've done Mm -hmm. all the hardship. So let's just have, you know, let's just figure out how we also have fun and delight and joy and lightness and playfulness and all the like, you know, areas where Mm -hmm. juicy things. I think when you're going for this, it's, it's having that balance, right? It's hard to be playful if you feel unsafe. Mm-hmm. It's, it's hard to go on a quest for joy if you don't feel grounded. My takeaway is like, oh, there's like two sides to this. Find a balance and make sure you do both of it. Yeah, it would be, yeah would, where, where like what, what comes up for me. Yeah, roots and wings, right? How, do we, and how wings. do we have both the safety yeah. and lightness? Yeah. And be mindful that every conversation is going to be different. I mean, I'm in two different relationships. And so in the conversation with my wife, it is, we do have safety and security in that, in that relationship. And we've been together for almost 10 years. You know, we can slip very easily into like roommate status Mm -hmm. if there isn't some checking in what happens there. And so I think those conversations are like, how can we remember that we're friends and hang out every once Mm -hmm. in a while? Mm -hmm. And I think my really, my conversations with my partners are more around how do we have more connection with each other or, mm-hmm. you know, moments for, for closeness and depth or what, again, what are, what are, what are the expectations around our household? And when mm-hmm. we're both working and it's a busy day, who's cooking dinner? What does that look mm-hmm. like? So I think just recognizing those conversations are different. I think to that end, another takeaway was her example about, I have historically been the caretaker. And so I'm wondering if you can take on X, Y, Z for, Mm -hmm. you know, for a month and let's try that out. And I think that is something that probably a story that's happened in my head. That's certainly a conversation I've had in my head Mm -hmm. where I, in my mind, there's like the rant of like, I have to do everything for all the people. Mm Can't you just, but I don't think that I've like had that conversation in that way to say, I'm generally, I'm the caretaker and I'm wondering if there are ways you can take care of me 
in the following mm-hmm. ways. I think naturally that happens in my relationships. And so, so I don't know, maybe, maybe that's why I haven't felt so pressed to, to, to share it in that way. Mm-hmm. And I love the reframe of that language. Yes. Yeah, no, I I can see, I can see how that's like super effective. I think also what you've mentioned around examining the roles that we step into automatically, like you're assuming that you're the person that clean, you know, cooks and cleans up, you know, I think a lot of the mm-hmm. time we have those on our minds, you know, we, we take on roles we don't even mm-hmm. realize. I think figuring out, naming those roles and saying, do they, do they fit me? Do I, do I want to show up? you know, in this role, in this relationship. So in your case, like you knowing that you show up as the, you show up as a caretaker, you know, I think I can take a break from that. So I think it's, it's, it's that it's like, you know, like with everything else, know thyself, name it. And if you need to change it, um, make a request. Yeah. The last two things that I'll note that were takeaways for me is just tapping into creativity. I loved the example that she gave about kind of drawing the picture of yourself or the outline of yourself and on the inside, writing down all the ways that you feel loved. I did a similar, I have a similar handout and activity that I do with my clients around the things that they love to do and kind of the, who they are. And then externally outside of that, the drawing of themselves, they write down all of the impact that they want to have and purpose in the world. Mm. And so that's actually what I was thinking was I'd love to draw a picture and and write down all the ways that I feel loved on the inside and all of the ways that I love and Mm. show my love Mm -hmm. on the outside and have my partner do that as well and and kind of sit with that exchange. So that sounds fun. And then of course, dance party. I mean, (laughs) dance party is just, I love dance party. Let's do dance party before relationship agreements. Let's do pillow fight in the midst of relationship agreements. Let's do playtime after. Yes to all of those things. things. Yeah. So, so again, I think I'm just, it, it makes sense to me that right now, now in my life, I'm drawn to to the ideas of joy, delight, play, wonder. Mm. And so I'm not surprised that those things resonated with me. Let's draw and let's dance. I like it. Yes, yes, yes. That was definitely a, a, a takeaway for me too. Last weekend, I was at a, a sound healing and somatic experiencing retreat for three days. And the person that I was on a retreat with, uh, Rida, she's actually going to be on the podcast in the coming weeks. She has a real super interesting, holistic, somatic um, look on things like emotional regulation and really getting in touch with our body and and making decisions from that from that mind body connection place. And the more I delve into that world, the more I realize how essential it is for things like relationship agreements, for things like deciding what the right structure for you is, and and all those kind of important decisions and definitely also relationship agreements. So that was like a, that was like a a fun connection to like, Oh, you need to get that right here too. Like you need to have that in place Mm -hmm. here too. In so many areas of our life, like, Mm -hmm. Oh, we really need to work on that mind body connection. People, (laughs) it is essential. (laughs) It is so essential. Right. Know yourself and be vulnerable, connect with your body, have communicate. Like they're just so it's like, it's the new version of like drink water make sure you sleep, (laughs) make sure you move. Like those are like, (laughs) yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So that was also my takeaway, like having, having combining of those things. The other thing for me was, I mentioned it at the time too, just how hopeful relationship agreements feel, at least to me mm. or to, you know, to my, I guess, um, sort of hopeful ear. It just feels like I get to create the relationship that I want and the nurture the connection that I want and really live a life that I like because I have this tool that are relationship agreements. Like that's, that's kind of, that, I mean, that's how I hear it. And I, I just imagine that how it can also sound to other people, even though it can also feel like we mm-hmm. talked about it, like controlling and, and like uh, oppressive. Yes. I see that at the same time, I just see it as such a powerful tool. And, you know, I coach about this all day long and, and I see when people get it right, it is empowering and it is liberating and it is hopeful and you see relationships transform into these containers where people are thriving and I loved hearing her talk about it because like she sounds so hopeful and and light and uh, empowered when she talks about it so that was like my takeaway I'm like yes it just sounds so good 
<laughs> You're like date night relationship agreement. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Like do it. And like, do, like the way she's saying do it with play, like there are areas you have to, I call it, you know, we talk about being co-CEOs. Like at some point you need to be co-CEOs um, because you're sharing life. Mm-hmm. And I think at some point you also just need to be childlike, you know, and playful. And I think just getting that balance right with the relationship agreements also, I think makes a huge difference. Do it, folks, do it. You can find Ari on Instagram at Coach Ari Kardosh, on Facebook at Ari Kardosh Coaching, and via her website, AriKardosh.com. You can find her book, Relationship Agreements, a simple and effective guide for strengthening communication, reducing conflict, and increasing intimacy to design your ideal relationship on our website at WeAreCuriousFoxes.com slash reading list. While you're on our website, check out our blogs and our articles that we have from educators and authors and from Effie and I about sex tips for thriving in open and monogamous relationships and resources for your personal growth. You'll also be able to find links to our Instagram and Facebook and find us at We Are Curious Foxes, where you can join the conversation about the podcast. For behind the scenes footage, mini episodes, and over 50 videos from educator-led workshops, go on to Patreon at We Are Curious Foxes. And you can support this work by subscribing to Apple Podcasts or following us on Spotify and Stitcher. And send us a rating or a comment so that we know that you are listening. And if you want to tell us about the podcast moments that have felt the most impactful or the topics that you'd like us to explore, then share with us via email. Send us an email or a voice memo at listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. Or you can record a question for the show by calling 201-870-0063. This episode is produced and edited by Nina Pollock whom we agree to love always. Our intro music is composed by Dave Saha. We are so grateful for their work. And we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. curious. Stay curious.